Um, if you can, I'd like to say welcome to our webinar today where we're going to be talking about personas, um, how, uh, how we create them, why we create them, why we use them, how we use them, all of these things we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be sharing some examples from some of the projects that Mila and I have worked on and also um, uh, examples from maybe the projects that our colleagues have worked on as well. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we had an amazing response to um, to this session. We had, uh, I think, 320 of you registered for today um, from some amazing companies, some of whom you can see represented here in some of the logos you can see on this screen. Um, so there's been a, there's obviously a lot of interest in this topic, which is great. Um, so looking at the Big Marker interface, you should see that you can make some comments in the chat window. I can see some of you commenting and saying hello already, which is great. Nice to see you all. Hello, Holly. Hello, Natasha. Hello, Jasmina. Really nice to have you with us today. Um, so what you should also see in the interface is a Q&A tab next to the chat uh, tab. Um, if, as we go through, you have uh, questions that you'd like uh, Mila and I to address, um, we, we can do that at the end. So if you'd like to drop your question into the, the, the Q&A tab, the Q&A window, um, we can pick them up at the end and have a look at those and, and talk about those. Um, I think you can um, you can vote on the questions that people place there. So if you'd like to see them raised higher in the list so that we get to them um, more quickly, you can vote for the questions that you think are interesting that you'd like to hear the answers to. Um, one of the questions that we often get asked in these webinars is whether we are going to be sharing our slides. Um, we won't actually be sharing these slides, but we are recording today's session. So um, if you would like a copy of that recording, you can uh, contact our colleague Joe Hutton, who invited you to today's session, um, and she'd be happy to share a copy of that video with you. Um, we, if you, I, I presume you've got Joe's contact details already, but if not, you'll see that one of the final slides that we will be showing today uh, has Joe's contact details. So make a note of those if you would like to get a copy of the recording. Okay, so um, having said that, let's get started. So uh, as I say, welcome to today's webinar on how we create effective personas and why you should too. We'll start by introducing ourselves. So um, I'll go first. Hi, I'm Andrew. Um, I am a lead consult UX consultant here at Bunnyfoot, uh, working on both the research and design side of uh, of UX. I've been in UX for quite a while now. I started in my first UX team or user-centered design team back in 2003, and I joined Bunnyfoot in 2014. I've worked on lots of interesting projects at Bunnyfoot for a variety of um, clients, some of which you can see here. And I also teach the customer, a couple of the training courses that we run here at, um, at Bunnyfoot. I teach the customer journey mapping, modeling, and information architecture course. Part of that course, we talk about personas. So some of the material we'll be looking at today um, you know, is derived somewhat from that course. Um, I also teach the behavioral science design for persuasion, emotion, and trust course. Um, we will give you a bit more information about that at the end of this slide deck in terms of some of the other courses that we teach you at Bunnyfoot that you might like to consider at some point. Um, I'll hand over to Mila so she can introduce herself. Hopefully without a trembling voice, I'll present myself. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mila, one of the principal consultants at Bunnyfoot. I'm also a service design lead and the sustainability officer, police officer, as I call it internally. And I've been with Bunnyfoot for four years. Uh, there's a couple of, well, a few actually, not a couple of clients that I've recently worked with. And similar to uh, Andrew, I also teach a few of our training courses. One of that is the service design course, uh, and the other one is the co-creation, innovation, and ideation course. Actually, both of them partially, to some extent, cover personas. Thus, I am on uh, this webinar presenting together with Andrew. Next, please. <laughs> so um, just a couple of words on who we are um, as a company. Some of you may be well aware of who we are. Some of you may have worked with us before. Some of you might, um, this might be your first contact with us. So just to say, um, Buddyfoot has been going now as a company for about 23 years, and we focus on research and design, uh, often digital, but not always. Um, we're a, a roughly about 40 strong team of specialist consultants and practitioners in UX. 
um, you know, experience design, uh, service design, and so on. We're based in a, a few locations, uh, pre predominantly London and Sheffield. I'm actually based in Oxford. Um, and uh, we basically what we do is we, we um, deliver research and design with a focus on evidence driven design. So looking to back up uh, all the design decisions that we together with you are making um, based upon sound kind of solid research and, and evidence of what people need and want. Um, we as a company are also now part of a, uh, a, a group of companies called the Sideshow Group. Um, essentially, uh, we, we've all got our different specialisms, but we're, you know, many of us focused on uh, delivery of uh, yeah, user experience in one form or another. So in terms of what we're going to be talking about today, we're going to start by talking about what, what are personas and giving some definition to that. Um, and then we're going to talk about, talk about why we use them. Um, and then we're going to talk about how we create them. And then once we've created them, what do we do with them? What happens next? So we'll be talking about that. And then we'll finish with um, a few minutes uh, left for Q&As, as I said at the beginning, where we can uh, address some of the, the questions you might have. All right. Yeah. I'll yeah, I'll take over with the first section uh, on what are personas. Um, speaking about what are personas, we can't but do and share a few definitions. So I'm going to spend some time and actually read this out because this person is considered to be the inventor or the father of personas. His name is Alan Cooper. And back in 2014, he said that Personas are detailed composite user archetypes that represent distinct groupings of behaviors, attitudes, aptitudes, goals, and motivations observed and identified during the research phase. So it's a great definition. I think in, in, in the very uh, concise format, it tells exactly what personas are. Uh, back in 80s, uh, Alan Cooper uh, was a developer himself and um, Imagine those times when people who were writing codes assumed that everyone is a code geek, when designers were trying to impress with flying menus and all of that beautiful, but not really user-friendly um, elements, uh, design elements. So Cooper had to create personas to be able to communicate users' needs to those who were far totally detached from research and the, the ones who were totally detached from uh, actual users. So I mentioned he was a developer himself and he used to role play users to kind of show what users will do. Uh, then he became a consultant and role playing wasn't the most efficient way of uh, sharing what, uh, what uh, users think, uh, customers think and what they do and what they want. So he had to come up with some kind of tool and personas came into life. And um, he said himself that personas became a kind of interaction design weapon because they were so great to communicate with designers and developers. And back in 1998, he actually wrote the book, uh, which is the, the cover of that book is here and a few of the slides uh, because he wanted to share the knowledge and to explain to the world how powerful the t this tool is. And guess what? It is powerful. We're still using it and um, putting it into our practice. The other very good definition which we decided to include is from um, these lovely uh, researchers, Pruitt and Adlin. And this is the uh, book that they wrote on persona life cycle. We highly recommend that book. It goes in depth on how to do personas and etc. So what they said is personas are clearly defined memorable representations of users that remain conspicuous in the minds of those who designed and built product. I, we can't say it better than them. Anyways, so to sum up, uh, personas are fictional, but they are representative uh, description of certain customer group or user group with distinct, distinct behaviors, attitudes, needs, wants, anxieties, blockers, motivations, triggers, goals. We're going in our how-to section cover a bit more of what goes there, but this like on a higher level. They are distilled from research, very often, often qualitative research or sometimes a mix of qual and quant. Um, 
personas give an understanding of, of customers that is grounded in reality. They place people at the heart of the process. They are not shaped by what business see and assumes, but it's really what is true. And they're used as a tool to inform the design, the future uh, features, services, products, uh, and they also reflect the reality of people's details, uh, detailed interactions with the thing uh, that we are designing. So a typical persona uh, consists of the following, the name, uh, which is sometimes distinct, sometimes very kind of real name that we have. Sometimes it could be a bit more creative. It consists of a quote, a snappy, um, uh, maybe sentence that kind of sum up what persona is about and what's their maybe the most crucial need. It also contains a photo or a drawing or a sketch or some visual um, graphic thing. Um, it also gives a brief background. It could be a story or a um, bit of a biography of that persona. It also includes anxieties, fears, constraints, pain points. It includes goals, triggers, tasks, and usually it includes dimensions. Later on, we'll explain what they are and how we, we go about them. So what personas are and what personas are not? As I've already mentioned, personas are plausible, uh, but fictional. They are representative of a particular segment of the audience or maybe the whole audience. Uh, they are behavior based. Um, they are memorable, they are concise, they are snappy, they are like a litmus test for design solution and ideas. They are rooted in research and they are living documents. So uh, they, you, you keep on improving them, building them up. So they are never set in stone and left forever on the bookshelf. What personas are not? They are not marketing segments. They are not exhaustive list of different features, different characteristics. They are not real person's biography. Uh, biography. Uh, they are not solely based on assumptions from especially senior stakeholders. And as I mentioned, they are not set once and used forever. They keep on um, improving and being updated. Let me illustrate uh, the difference between demographics uh, and behaviors. So can you think of anyone uh, who will fit this uh, demographic information? Someone who is white, male, born in the UK in 1948, had two, uh, two marriages, uh, has great income, more than one million, we're all dreaming about these days, and has at least two children. So that could be this lovely person who is a king, of our country now, or it could be equally this lovely person who is uh, Ozzy Osbourne. Would these people share the same behaviors? Big question mark. Would they have the same intentions, motivations, goals? I doubt. They have very distinct and very different individuals. So you see, they share the demographics, but they don't share the behaviors. And the personas are the ones that uh, share commonalities, similar things in terms of behaviors. Let me give you another quick illustration. Personas are not the same as market segments. So we might have different market segments, like here in this example, segment uh, one, uh, which is like young family, segment two, or like young couple, and segment two is more mature couple. Uh, they are different segments, but they share the same behavior. Uh, while segment three have a totally different behavior to the first two segments. So uh, behaviors can exist across multiple segments. And in personas, we capture that, not their age, income, but even though it could go into biography, but it's not the focus. It's not the main purpose of persona. Uh, another little example, personas are not an overwhelming list of different characteristics. You may cherry pick certain uh, details and additional information about persona. But having an exhaustive list like this would not serve the purpose. They need to be catchy, snappy, concise, to the point, memorable, and recognizable. They say it's not memorable at all. So we might include a few details, but we don't go into this extensive list um, and spreadsheets, moreover. Um, there are different types of personas. 
probably many of you have tried uh, and know some of those. So assumption-based personas, research-based personas, archetypes and anti-personas. So briefly on each of those. Assumption-based personas, um, they are also known as sketch personas, proto-personas, lean personas, pen po portraits. So you probably came across a few of those definitions. They are all assumptions-based personas used very often in the workshop format. They are very rough customer portraits that you make up together as a team. Uh, they are uh, quickest to produce, cheapest to produce, but they're really good for externalizing all the assumptions, especially the ones that stakeholders have about the users. They are good to build up those hypotheses and um, get all the information about the target audiences, identify a few user groups, gather insights for the recruitment criteria, and prepare areas for focus for the research phase. So these are assumption-based personas. Uh, we also have research-based ones, which are actually real personas. And there are three ways how you can create those depending on which data you, um, you, you have. So qualitative personas, uh, these are, I would say, the main type of personas, the ones that we deliver the most. And actually, uh, these are, I would say, one of the best to do and the easiest to do, the quickest to do. So they are rooted in research data collected from qualitative um, research methods, such as interviews, diary, diary studies, usability tests, field studies, such as contextual inquiries or observation. Um, you can also do the mixed research methods personas. They're the ones that get in the best from the two worlds. So you do your qualitative research and then you get support and validation from a survey. There are also statistical personas, which are really labor intensive and really hard to do and very budget intense. Um, and they involve both qual and qual research and you do the statistical analysis to find those clusters and similar responses. So they're hard to do, you need data analysts basically to, uh, to do that. So in most cases, uh, we go with qualitative personas or mixed research personas. And the other type is the archetypes. Maybe you've heard of that or you came across. They're also known as behavioral segments. So they are like full personas, research-based personas, but without the demographics. So they describe a trait on the behavioral spectrum, but they don't go deep into like assembling those into like full personas. So they're really good when you're working, uh, you're representing large groups of populations, or for example, you don't want to distract your, uh, for example, developers with all this biography or names or the photos. So basically you skip that. So it's kind of leaner version of a uh, full persona without photo name and biography. And the last but not least is anti-personas. So who are they? Uh, they're basically a representation of a user group, uh, the person who might misuse a product or the service, and in this way negatively impact other users or the business. That could be done intentionally, like in the case of thieves or creatives, creators of illegal content, uh, or it could be done unintentionally, such as if the child uses the product and service and something happens. So they're really um, good for companies or for maybe the products or the services that deals with sensitive information, which could be misused and then create some threats and risks. So these antipersonas illustrate the threats and, uh, and risks and help companies to mitigate um, those. So how you do them, you do the same uh, way as normal personas. Uh, you do the research into the threats and risk, and then you create those. Um, usually, um, these anti-personas include the name, face, goal, motivations and needs, action tools and consequences. So you can clearly see what are the risks and how, as a business, you will go about mitigating those risks and avoiding them. All right, enough on what, let's move into why we use personas and um, yeah, what's the goodness in these tools. Okay, thanks Mila. So yeah, I, I noticed Jane Charlton saying that um, she's in the past been advised not to use photos of people in personas. So we sometimes do and we sometimes don't. And where we don't, we perhaps tend to refer to these as Mila said, as archetypes or behavioral segments. But the reason why often 
photos and a name and a, something of a personal biography is used within a persona is just to help um, teams kind of connect to that persona and it's easier to connect to this idea of a an, a person um, as you hopefully have sort of gathered by now um, these personas are are not representatives of, of a real person they are kind of a collective represent representation of a group of people that share behaviors um, but they're presented as if they are a single person because that you know, as I say that helps um, people re that are reading the persona to kind of relate to them but indeed um, you know you, you do have to be careful of photographs sometimes I've certainly worked on projects where we've had to really consider uh, and maybe change the photographs that we're using so that we're not kind of tapping so we're, we're kind of avoiding stereotypes or uh, uh, and that sort of thing so I, I do get what you're saying there Jane okay so why we use personas let's uh, let's um, have a, a chat about that um, so uh, Mila has uh, already mentioned Alan Cooper, the father of personas, um, and he makes the point, which is perhaps obvious to many of us working in the, the field of UX, um, but which isn't always so obvious to everybody. And we kind of that that's, that's our job really is to, to remind people that we need to get out of the building um, as designers and as product um, managers and so on to find out who our users are and to figure out what they're trying to accomplish. Um, the greatest insight that you get um, from understanding uh, the, the greatest uh, the greatest insight that we can get is understanding why they are trying to accomplish um, what they're trying to do, like what is their desire. Um, and once you've learned this, uh, you need to find a way to express it. And personas are one way of uh, and a very effective way of expressing what you've learned about your users or a, a set of users and what their kind of goals uh, and needs are and what their perhaps their frustrations and pain points are. Um, so again, uh, preaching to the converted perhaps here, but you know, a fundamental truth uh, is that you are not your audience, your user, your customer. Um, it's very easy as a designer to sit in a room and come up with all sorts of clever ideas of designs that you might come up with, features you might add. Um, but you know, if, if that's coming just from your perspective, the danger is that, well, you don't necessarily see things the way that you're your users do you don't necessarily know what they know you don't you don't want what they want and you don't work how they work so all of that is really critical information when thinking about the design of a product or a service um, so going out and speaking to your users of course is therefore really vital um, so you know that's what we aim to do in this user-centered uh, UX process where we go out and we conduct our research we obtain the right evidence in the most effective way um, and then we seek to apply that to the design of whatever it is that we're considering uh, to, you know, with the goal of improving the customer experience. The difficulty is sometimes is that that gap between the research phase and the design phase and tools like personas and other models, which we'll touch upon uh, in this webinar, um, really help to bridge that gap between those two stages. And they connect the research that we've done, um, identifying kind of actionable insights that can then very, very easily be applied into that, that design phase where we start to um, ideate on potential solutions and prioritizing those and moving those forward into um, actual designs. So some of you will have come across this, this user-centered design framework where we start with um, the research, we move through into the modeling phase, which is the phase where we where personas for example are being created and then moving forward into the architecting and uh, and designing phases um and uh you know as i say modeling is you know, personas are happening at the point where we've, we've gone out we've done some research with our end users and we're starting to try and distill the insight that we've got into tools that help teams to understand and empathize with their users and to generate and inform design ideas and it's worth saying that you know, the time, the effort, the resources you put into the initial research and modeling phases um, is money and, and time well spent because often that the insights that you gain through doing that can then be applied across many different channels, whether that's looking at your web design or looking at your um, you know, marketing communications, whatever it might be. Um, often the insight that is contained within a persona can be, can be a, a, you know, widely applied across different channels. 
So, you know, in this modeling phase, we use various maps and models to help us understand what we're seeing in the research uh, and kind of transferring that into actionable uh, insights. Each of these different models, whether they are personas or customer journey maps or mental content models and so on, they all have their unique benefits. And um, we might apply them in for different reasons in different situations. Um, uh, but there are there are commonalities um, across them in that they are looking at what user needs are, uh, who those users are, um, uh, what their kind of points of pain points might be, and what opportunities therefore might exist. Um, but personas is often where we start because for all of these different maps and models, we're usually describing them from the point of view of a particular persona. Or if we don't have personas, then from a, the point of view of a particular kind of user role or user category. Um, so, you know, personas, as I've kind of indicated already, they're, they're really good at putting a human face on what might otherwise be a, a rather impersonal requirements process. So, you know, if you've got a persona or a set of personas describing some of your kind of key user groups, um, as Mila was saying, based upon the, the, the common behaviors that that group um, displays, then they, you know, they provide a high level summary of the requirements. You just, all you need to do is look through the goals, look through the tasks that people are trying to accomplish, look through the, uh, the pain points that they might be currently experiencing. And that immediately allows you to start seeing what it is that you might be looking to, to design to. Um, so they um, help our designs to address a real human need rather than just a, a product team kind of brainstorming um, in their own uh, kind of bubble. They're actually helping to bring that user in um, and making sure that we connect all of our design decisions to actual insight from the research that we've done uh, with the end users. They can help us to prioritize design features. We'll, um, we, you can prioritize your personas. Maybe there's a primary persona that might help you when you're thinking about, well, you know, these are all the things we could do, but what should we apply uh, ourselves to first? And they can help keep the, the project scope pragmatic um, and prevent feature creep. Um, it's, you know, you, we, could, we could do anything potentially, but looking at these personas, what should we do? Um, and because they're, as Mila was saying, they're quite snappy, they're quite concise, they're easy to look at. Um, they're therefore kind of, yeah, easy to act upon and easy to kind of share amongst a, a team to create that common shared vision amongst a, a product and design team. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Now is the time to move into uh, the section on how to create effective personas. So um, I think this is the slide to prove that we are credible to talk about that because we produce personas for many clients and probably some of these clients are here uh, watching this webinar as well. Um, so quite a few <laughs> during all the years that we've been working at Bunnyfoot. So essentially, this is the process. This is the approach of creating and generating a persona. It contains three stages and nine steps. So we'll go through uh, each stage and all the steps one by one. And the process might look like this. Uh, this is a quick overview of how it especially used to look before the pandemic or the offline version with many sketches, post-it notes, uh, and the final results, or it might look like this. This is something that probably we're all working in the post-pandemic world, the online version using different software tools such as Miro or Mural or Myra. We still don't know how to call it. <laughs> so starting with the first stage, which is the conception stage, which consists of three steps. So the first step, uh, the starting point, is identifying initial important categories, like target kind of categories of users and the customers. And there are different things that we can do at this stage to kind of get the, the data and start to think of how to go about the research. So we obviously start probably with reviewing the existing materials, the research and the data that we have up to date. And the, we ha can have different resources, so such as market research and market segmentation. We've covered that, but it's a good starting point. Training manuals and the sources, HR, onboarding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Product management documents, business analysts, customer services, previous personas, maybe the ones that've been dusted and not looked at for a couple a couple number of years, or maybe the personas that were produced before the pandemic and 
you know, the world has changed. So is the personas changed? So is needs changed? So uh, you might use the previous ones, but time to review and build the new ones. The other thing you can do is to run a stakeholder workshop. And the typical activities would be uh, identifying key user groups and doing some brainstorming, doing sketch personas, working with dimensions, creating empathy maps, jobs, pains, and gains. And if you have time and budget, you can also do uh, some interviews, in-depth interviews with your stakeholders instead of, for example, running a, a workshop. And here are some examples of running a workshop offline. Uh, we are coming back to that more and more these days, so doing like hybrid versions. And this is an example of how running a workshop looks like online these days. As I mentioned, there are different activities you can do. So one of those is brainstorming, just the basic core, your user types and writing on your post-its. And these initial categories uh, can come from uh, the description of user roles, job roles, key activities, user goals, general specific ones, and user segments, the shared characteristic, demographics, psychographs, attitudes, and um, some additional quant data that you might find. Then, of course, sketch personas. So we showed already a few uh, examples, but this is like a typical template um, that many um, UX specialists and service design specialists use. And here's uh, some examples of how it might look like as a final uh, result. And empathy mapping. So we've mentioned that. That's a kind of the good tool that works in conjunction with personas. It helps to create that empathy and provide a snapshot, a snapshot of persona's experience, which covers what persona is thinking, feeling, saying, doing, hearing during a particular uh, activity within the service. And as I mentioned, if you have a, um, some budget and time, uh, doing interviews with your key stakeholders would be great and will provide really uh, rich data compared to workshops because you can go into details and uh, structure your um, interviews covering the topics of uh, ro stakeholders' roles in business and how they relate to the project, what are their goals and for the project outcome, existing conceptions of the audience, and many more questions. And the second step I'll hand over to Andrew. Great, thanks, Mila. I was just looking at Darren. Darren Smith asked a question of can you give a uh, an idea of typical time scales. Well, that's kind of that's always going to vary depending on the project and the resources and you know how many research interviews you want to run. But we, you know, at Bunnyfoot we tend to keep things quite kind of again quite snappy in in and, and fast in the processes that we we go we, we work, the way we work. So you might spend a few days doing some research, maybe sort of back to back interviews over a few days. Um, you might then spend, you know, perhaps up to a week doing the analysis and starting to draw together um, your 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 skeleton personas. You might spend a, a you know a few more days reviewing that, perhaps with your stakeholders, depending on how responsive they are. Um, and then, you know, maybe maybe another day or two in terms of sort of the final presentation of these. So they can be done quite quickly if you're efficient in your processes. Um, but you know, it will vary from project to project and what you're aiming to get out of it. Um, okay, step two, um, execute appropriate research. Okay, so the purpose here is, you know, you're going out, as we said before, to, to speak to your end users, uh, looking at or looking at the kind of the other data points, whether it's diary studies or surveys and so on. And the, the aim is to generate insights, to test the assumptions that you might have uh, you know, established in the stakeholder workshops, perhaps that Mila was just talking about, um, and, you know, and aiming to fill in any knowledge gaps that you might have. Um, so... Uh, for example, you know, there's there's various ways that you might go about doing that research. Um, as Mila said before, we we very often you know use depth interviews as a key part in that um, that insight gathering process, uh, whether that's you know over the telephone or in person or over Zoom. Um, we might run diary studies if you're interested to to know uh, to see see how people are, are behaving and thinking. Um, you know in the moment over a period of time. Diary studies can be a, a good way of doing that. That's We've, we've run many of those. Um, uh, user testing, of course, usability testing, observing people actually using the thing that you're, you're, you're considering the design of. Um, that can be a great kind of uh, insight, um, area of insight. Uh, field studies, we sometimes go out and we'll do contextual research or observation in locations 
whether it's in uh, Hampton Courts, as these pictures show, or perhaps in the British Library, which we've, we've done projects with before, looking at how people kind of enter, um, enter that space and go about what they need to do. Um, and you might be um, looking at the, the, uh, the, the data that's been returned from surveys. Um, if you are running research interviews, then you'll likely produce a, uh, a, a research interview guide, a protocol, um, where you'll be seeking to kind of ask open questions in a semi-structured sort of format, uh, where um, you know you're 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 focusing on questions which aim to draw out you know how people are using the product or service that you're considering, um, how it fits into their daily lives, why they're using it, what their goals are. Um, you know what sort of triggers the the, the use, you know, uh, and what kind of tasks are they aiming to uh, undertake in order to achieve those goals? Um, how do they go about this? What are their behaviours, and what are their perceptions currently of of how they can go about this? You know, what do they like? What do they dislike? What do they find difficult, frustrating? All of this is really useful information, and all of this then can be, um, you know, transformed into uh, insights that can go into your personas. Um, um, and, you know, a question that we often get asked is how many research interviews do I need to conduct? And again, that's going to vary depending on many things, you know, what you're aiming to find out, how many different user groups you've identified, um, how much how much sort of time and how many resources you've got. Um, but as a rule of thumb, we have a way of thinking about it at Bunnyfoot. And that is that we need to we, we feel like you should consider at least sort of five um, five research interviews per user type or per user role, per segment that you've identified perhaps in those stakeholder workshops. And, um, you know, we, we also noticed that the the Norman, uh, the Nielsen and Norman group um, also sort of say something similar. So, but they um, they, they say that you know, start by interviewing five to 30 users um, and, you know, uh, per, per user group, um, Oh, sorry, as a rolling sample of five users per user group, so sort of similar to what what we think. Um, the difference here is that they, um, you know, they they suggest that actually you kind of keep it a bit open. So once you've interviewed those five users of a, in a particular group, um, you know, if you find that you're still getting new insights from each um, significantly new insights from each interview, you might then consider doing a few more until you're not um, really gaining any extra insight. From running any further interviews so if you're able to do that and if you're able to keep the kind of process open um, then that that's a, a, a potential way of determining when you've um, run enough uh, uh, sessions but it's worth thinking about this in relation to the, the different types of kind of segments different user roles that you've you've identified and you're aiming to kind of to get insight into in terms of their behaviors and characteristics um okay yeah step three mila uh, thank you. Uh, just a little note. Um, we can see all the Q&A questions and they're lovely. Some of them we will actually address later. So you'll see it's along the lines of what you're asking. So please keep voting and adding questions and we'll probably go through all of them at the end, especially uh, the ones that are top voted. So please be engaged there and add your questions. Some of them are really lovely. I even voted for a few to answer. <laughs> so, uh, and another thing just to add, uh, the, the time scale, as, um, as Andrew mentioned, if you're running a diary study and some diary studies are longitudinal study and could take a long time. So this kind of research phase might get really extended for quite a while and might take a few months even. Or even I, the, I, was, I was thinking I was giving an example where it might just be depth interviews that you might be running but yeah of course if you want to then extend that into kind of diary studies and surveys all of that's going to add at the time. Yeah. yeah indeed so yes step number three uh, is so you've collected all your beautiful research data and it's time to process it. So the purpose is the extracting the information that is relevant to uh, your users, customers, product and service domains. And, you know, in the UX world, the service design world, we are famous for using post-its and pulling out the facts uh, and then creating those post-its, analyzing them, clustering them and pulling the themes, the common themes. So doing affinity mapping, which is a beautiful, more scientific word of calling this process or diagramming, affinity diagramming is the very good way to go 
about analyzing your qualitative data. It's strongly collaborative. It's quick and easy to understand. It works across different um, data formats and sources. We'll have a screenshot later of incorporating insights from uh, interviews and from surveys and kind of analyzing them together. It's also worth exploring dimensions at this point, and later I'll tell you what are they. And the formats at this stage, so obviously you can do everything uh, on your own if you're the only person doing it, or together with your research or project team, or you might involve stakeholders in a more collaborative analysis session. There's some screenshots, but we'll show a few more. So if we're doing it offline, that's how it might look like. Uh, getting the facts from the interview, posting those facts, creating those factoids. That's the um, scientific word, uh, the term for, for this. Grouping into themes and building up the dimension and analyzing. Uh, it might look like this in the online version. And, uh, or it might look like this also online. It's one of the projects when we had extensive amount of data collected from interviews with stakeholders from audience interviews, so from survey finding, and that was the grouping into themes, pulling out the information from all three data sets that we had. It was massive project, lots of data to go through, but beautiful results. Uh, so I mentioned collaborative analysis workshop. It's a good way to go. It's best to do it with your colleagues. When you create it and uh, kind of created those factoids, the, the post-its with the key insights, and then you're coming up together. And that's the, by the way, to address one of the questions about how to remove biases. If you're working with research data only, and if you're inviting other people to join the workshop, so it would be not one brain analyzing everything, but it would be a collaborative efforts. So that could mitigate those biases. And you're using with research data, not with the assumptions that you collected previously. So you'll go with that round, you'll collect your findings, you synthesize them into themes, and then you might go into further analysis, kind of until you start seeing the, the behavioral spectrums. So those themes that uh, could later develop into dimensions. And uh, just to, to tell what dimensions are and why we use them. So basically, these are the, the, the dimensions are behavior spectrums along which you can plot your personas, behaviors, and characteristics. So they really help to identify the similarities and the differences that our personas ha have. And it's a great visual tool in a very quick way to see the, the where the personas are. So this is an example of the digital behavior. So this particular persona is more like a novice with very lots of time to spend kind of frequent user and really knows what they want. So it's just an example. And this dimension in a very quick and visual way help to grasp what is behind that persona. And it's good to start developing that through the analysis phase. You can also do it earlier on when you're working with assumptions, but this is research-based uh, dimensions. So we've processed our data, uh, we've analyzed, and now we are moving to the second stage, uh, which is called gestation. And it's about starting to create those draft personas, which are called skeletons, prioritizing them if you have too many. There was one of the questions in the Q&A about the number of numbers of personas and developing those skeletons into personas. So uh, the cre creation of skeletons. So basically, it's like a stepping stone into producing personas. You can't jump from like post-its straight into personas. I mean, you can hypothetically, but it's best to do this kind of intermediary step, creating those skeletons, uh, like the straw man of personas, uh, where you, uh, something which is like a rough draft, which is good to share back with the team or good to present back to stakeholders or potentially develop those with the stakeholders, which is a very powerful way of doing it. And the these when creating those skeletons, you kind of validate your initial personas groupings. So they're not yet personas, they're skeletons, but you can see the themes that are coming up. So it's good to ask yourself, does it your skeleton if, in relation to a specific skeleton, like the draft persona, does it represent a specific design target? Does it represent a business priority? Is that skeleton clearly unique compared to the others? So you start kind of 
getting those answers before you develop it further into personas. Usually you create one skeleton for each potential persona. It's brief, bullet points listed um, data. You don't give it names that will come later. You just group the key information on the consistent sections. So the sections should be the same so that you can see how different those personas are and if they are the right ones. As I mentioned, you can do it on your own or you can do it in a collaborative workshop. Interestingly, you can use the same tool as we mentioned earlier on, uh, which is a pen portrait or like sketch personas. So earlier on, you've used it based on assumptions in your initial workshop, uh, workshop with stakeholders. This time is very different. This time you are getting, you're building those sketch personas or draft personas, let's call them this way, um, based on research data. You're pulling all the key insights from the research and then creating those drafts of your future personas. Uh, and these are some of the examples of using the standard templates and, uh, and doing that online uh, with the whole team. And if you come up with too many personas, which could happen, and I think we'll have a separate slide on how many personas it's best to create, but sometimes you might come up with, I don't know, 10 uh, skeletons. So it's good to go through the price prioritization and identifying primary and secondary targets uh, because you can't have more than six personas. It's, it's way too many to focus. So it's good if you came up with too many skeletons to prioritize based on frequency of use of your product or service, size of the market, maybe may, may potential revenue and the strategic importance. So yes, if you have too many, please don't skip this step. It's a very important one to go through. And uh, Andrew? Yeah, so, you know, once you've, you've, um, you're happy with your skeletons, that's the point where you're going to start turning these into personas um, in order to humanize them um, or to add some extra kind of clar clarity or, and, and to make sure that they are visually appealing. Now, these are tools that we want to be able to share with our colleagues and across the business. So if they're visually appealing uh, and enticing to look at, then they're going to be noticed and and you know, read more. Um, so, you know, here is the point where we might be adding uh, things like, you know, details like, you know, that that personas, we're going to give them an, an, maybe some characteristics like an age and a name. That name might be a human na name, and it, but it might also be a kind of behavioral characteristic name. Like, you know, you might be um, uh, Stephen and Jane, let's say, but your kind of characteristic name is kids first, because when you're considering holidays, you have got a young family and, you know, making sure your kids are happy uh, might be a sort of a key characteristic. You, so you might give them some biographical information, um, giving them a bit of context, adding a bit of storytelling information, but not being careful not to overdo it. In the, you know, uh, in the end of persona, the, the, the most useful things in a persona are uh, the information about, you know, a persona's kind of needs and goals and um, uh, um, wants and pain points in relation to what you're designing. The, the kind of the background detail and characteristics are just to bring them to life a little bit and to help you, people empathize with them. Um, you know, photos might help with that. And as Mila was showing before, when she gave an, uh, showed an example of a persona, you might be adding a quotation which kind of sums that persona up and so on. Um, you might then put those together, package those together as a, as a, as a PDF and sh as a way of sharing it. You might um, produce these on, say, a, a whiteboard like Miro so that you know, they're easy to access and, and maybe edit in the future. We've done that before for clients. Um, sometimes we provide like a high fidelity version, which can be printed out nice and large and stuck up around the, the building or in kind of design war rooms and so on. Um, and we might, you know, even sometimes we produce video compilations where for, if we've run depth research interviews we might um therefore uh, make some video e extracts and piece those together to um, again i guess to help bring those personas to life to show real people talking from the perspective of, of that persona um in terms of how many i, I noticed that um, peter you asked about numbers um and mill has already, already sort of indicated that as a rule most projects tend to have between about three and six personas you know um yeah, three and six personas, because this is easy to remember. It helps give our designs focus. Um, and it's worth remembering that these aren't real people. We're not aiming to describe, you know, each and every person that we've, for example, interviewed. Um, we're aiming to sort of collate those behaviors into archetypes, as, as we've already said. 
Um, but it will depend also on the business objectives. You might, you know, there might be different aspects of the service or the website that you're providing. So potentially, I guess, you could have a set of personas which is focused on one side of the business and another set of personas focused on, on another aspect of your product um, or, or, or business or service. Potentially, I guess that's 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 possible. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure that they are relevant to the product and to, to your business to help with those design decisions. Uh, we want to make sure that they're based on data and they they have um, uh, you know and, and that they're engaging and enlightening. In terms of a few tips for you know when you're at this stage of producing your personas, you know we want to be uh, concise. Um, they should be, as we said before, easy to read, easy to manage. Um, we want to kind of avoid um, uh, information that kind of dilutes the really important behaviors. So if you've got 100 sentences in your in your um, persona, then they're only, each sentence is only going to get 1% of the attention. If you've got, only got 10 sentences, then that's going to get, each one is going to get 10% of the uh, of the attention. So you know, make sure you're very intentional in what you're applying and ask the question, you know, does it, does it, will it help you in the decisions that you need to make when you're thinking about your product or your service? Um, you know, so for every detail, that you include, you can ask, well, what is the purpose of including that? This is it going to help me? Um, and also, you know, obviously, avoid uh, or minimize duplication of information. So that's one of the benefits of uh, using these spectrums of behavior. You can it helps you to um, make your personas significant, you know, sufficiently distinct and different from each other, so that you don't have lots of um, duplicated or repeating tasks across personas. Basically for each behavior, um, each behavior should be captured in you know, really kind of one of your uh, personas rather than you know all of them. Otherwise they start to merge together and they're not really representing therefore different um, kind of behavior segments. Um, active, use, think about the visual hierarchy um in your persona set so design or in your persona kind of presentation um you know design for people that are just going to glance at them or people that are going to scan the information maybe uh, you know quickly or you know and also provide sort of some further information for those that are going to actually sit down and read them when you've got your set of personas and you're presenting them perhaps in a in a, in a pdf it can be nice to start with an overview introduction to your personas. You might do it something like this, or you might do it something like this, where you are uh, providing the, the, that dimension information for each persona, which gives a, a very quick visual summary of how they how they differ from each other. Um, and yeah, um, that that's kind of the gestation phase. I think Mila's gonna say a couple of things on maturation. Yes, before I do that, there were quite a few questions on slides and recordings. Uh, there would be recordings available. Uh, you can send a note to Jo Hutton, our colleague, uh, and she will forward the recording. Um, slides we won't be sharing, but the recording, yes, which is more valuable, I guess. And uh, we're also aware of the time, so we'll have to speed up a little bit to make sure that we answer our questions in the Q&A. So very briefly on maturation uh, stage, uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, great if the time and budget allows to do a survey to kind of enrich the data and expand the data and validate the personas that you came from the qualitative research and the questions you might probe uh, and include is the demographic information, habits, interactions, additional requirements, slogan preferences, image affinities, you can go and, and be creative about it, again, if you have time and budget. And this kind of helps to, um, to check those personas and retest the appropriateness of them. The other step is promoting uh, your personas within your organization, educating and engaging uh, wider stakeholders of the business. There's many ways you can do it. Some of the things that we've done uh, were, for example, printing cups, doing T-shirts, creating posters, even putting posters in like a gym uh, while presenting the personas and advising everyone to do an exercise before we can reveal the persona so you can make it really engaging. We did social media profiles and blogs, creating fun games, doing company-wide persona days when you're presenting, doing kind of flash mobs. It's up to your 
creativity, um, how you can do it. Uh, the main thing is using them and educating the rest of the team or the rest of the company that they exist and here they are for your use. And the last but not least is that the persona that you create based on research is only 90% complete. The other 10% is additional things. It's like a live document. It's you, you will do ongoing validation. If you're creating the, I don't know, wireframes, doing the prototypes, testing them, there would be insights that you will get from that further research of further interactions. And you might bring it back and enrich your persona. So it's it's never ending process. You keep it alive. You allow it to grow and adapt to the needs um, of your users. So what's next? You have your personas. What? How do you go about them? Um, yeah. Well, sometimes we are, we work on projects where we're just you know the end point for us is a set of personas which we then hand over. But very often they're part of a a process. Um, often they are accompanied with. Um, other modeling tools which help to draw up further uh, information and actionable insights so you might you might combine a persona which gives you a nice summary of your different user types and then you might expand that perhaps into a journey map showing their experience over time and the kind of the the the, the different uh, tasks and goals uh, step by step and the different pain points they might be experiencing along a, a journey and you can kind of expand upon your insight in that way and actually often um, the research you do to inform a persona or to build personas can also can then be used to um, you know create some of these other maps and models. It's not like you need to kind of go out necessarily and do another round of research. So, for example, you might be using personas and then ex uh, in combination with um, mental content models, which are really good for identifying, let's say, the information needs perhaps of a of a, a persona. Again, as I say, often these other maps and models are told from the point of view of a particular persona or you know the, or the variety of personas that you've got um, and the good thing about mental content models is that you can for all of the the needs that you can establish um, for uh, in your mental model you can then map content to that to see how um, you might address those needs you might be use, using them in combination with uh, something called jobs to be done which is another way of describing um, uh, user needs um, and breaking that down and providing further detail that perhaps you've listed in your persona but then want to expand upon. Um, uh, here's another example of that. And of course, you know, we, we're not producing personas for the sake of producing personas. We're producing them to help in a, a, in a design effort. So, you know, many of the projects that we work on, we, we might start with research, moving into models like personas and using that insight to start um, designing um, and building wireframes um, and user testing those and in the end resulting in a finished product. Um, I should, yeah, I, I had a couple of um, case studies which I think I'm going to basically skip. Uh, essentially, I saw, see Dora is here. We worked with Dora at the Chatham uh, House where we went through a process of creating personas um, and then moving into kind of other activities like uh, when we're thinking about the redesign of the website. So doing a content audit, uh, running stakeholder workshops to get a sense of, you know, what the what the, the business goals were or what the kind of feature new feature ideas were, looking at what the the, the research and the personas were telling us and, and kind of ideating around that, creating mental content models, as I said, drafting up an information architecture, test uh, gaining further insight into the way that people want to structure uh, the content by running card sorting, test updating the ID, IA and testing that with a method called tree testing, and then finalizing the IA, um, and which then can be kind of fed into the design process where we ended up with a very nice, um, well-structured uh, website uh, as a result. So let's um, skip forward to the conclusion where basically in terms of key takeaways, what we're trying to say is that personas are great tools to bridge from your research through to your design activities. They're a great way of understanding what your key requirements are for your various user groups. They help keep design decisions focused on real user needs, and they help to create a shared vision across your design teams and product teams. And we would love to work with you and your teams if you are interested in um, developing uh, some personas as part of your research and design activities. Um, if you'd like to, uh, another way of uh, interacting with us would be to come on some of our 
or one of our training courses, whether that's uh, the course on customer journey mapping and modeling, where we talk about um, um, personas. As Mila mentioned, we also touch upon personas in other courses like service design. Um, so that these span across the whole range of design and delivery, kind of um, the, the design, the, the discovery to delivery um, uh, uh, spectrum. And you know, if you would like to talk to us further, we'd love to hear from you. And um, you could start by reaching out to Joe Hutton um, in order to do that. So um, I think quite a lot of the questions that I've been looking at, we have actually addressed, um, we subsequ subsequently addressed in some of our um, in some of our slides. So for example, how, you know, I think Joanna, you're at the top, well done, 12 votes. Um, you were talking about how to keep um, research-based personas um, alive and active and actually how to use them. Mila talked a little bit about, about how to do that. Um, but essentially that, you know, from my perspective, it's once you've got them, you know, presumably you're, um, or at least in my experience, you're in you're in the, in the midst of a of a, a kind of a design process. So you're using the 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 um, the insights from that persona in order to sort of kick off an ideation phase where you're thinking about what how you know what features you might um, be providing to your users, prioritizing those, starting to draw those up and sketch those out into wireframes and so on, and user testing them. So you know that's one way of of using them and, and keeping them active. Some me don't mention some of the other ways that we might you know try and keep them active in um, in a company. I've heard of all sorts of weird and wonderful ways that you know companies use to keep personas front of mind for people. Yeah, I just like a little addition because I think Dora also asked similar question. Uh, I've seen and we've used it. If you run a few different research projects, it's sometimes it's good even in your findings of the reports of completely different research to actually put a slide. Do we remember those? These are our targets. Basically bring them in, in every activity you do. And if you're sharing back the insights, even from the other one, it's good to remind and keep them always at the upfront of every project that you run, no matter how small or big it is. I think um, Kat's got a good question. So, you know, which is, um, can you share more about how you identify and create realistic dimensions? I assume this is associated to things like proficiency, but it would be great to know more. Um, any thoughts on that, Mila? Oh, dimensions, that's, it's like, so this, I, I think for me, this goes back to, you know, you can start thinking about dimensions right at the get go when you go in into your stakeholder workshops and you start thinking about, you know, a, a particular, um, when you start thinking about that your user types and you can start thinking about, well, you know, what could we anticipate some of these dimensions might be? So, for example, if you're looking to book a holiday, what what, what might some of the dimensions be there? So we could we could assume that perhaps you know some some user types are more focused on let's say budget holidays, and for other types they might not be concerned about kind of budget at all, and, and are looking for premium, high quality, uh, more expensive holidays. So that's a spectrum there that you might anticipate, and then you might start like plotting your different persona personas against you know, some some will be looking more for budget some will be looking more for premium that's an example of a spectrum um any sort of yeah the other maybe example especially talking about services would be um the knowledge the enthusiasm the time there's a kind of and um previous experience this is like also the common one that usually come up in the dimensions and in and as, as Andrew mentioned, right at the beginning, it's a great little exercise to kickstart your process, uh, to kickstart your project and kind of get in that. And from every one of the stakeholders, what would be like the key areas, the key themes, they might pop up later in, through the research phase, but highly likely some of those, the main ones, they would be based even on the assumptions you can grasp those. Mm. And maybe the last question, given the time and the fact that we have actually answered quite a lot of the questions, I think, in the slides, Maybe the one from Georgia, where she says, "Do you, um, what do you do if you have little data to start building persona sketches before the research phase?" Um, well, you know that goes back to what we we're saying about these stakeholder workshops. If you can get the right people in the room that already have some contact and experience with their user base and customer base, there are you know you can glean a lot of insight just by talking to the stakeholders as an, an as a start in the process. So they will have some idea. Um, and some contact with their customers. So th we, these are assumptions. We haven't gone out and validated them yet with the research, but starting to, to create these sketch personas from the knowledge that is in the room with you in that stakeholder workshop 
is a good starting point. And that does help you to think about, well, who might we be reaching out towards for recruitment? What sorts of things might be we be talking about and questioning people on in the in the research um, sessions and so on? So, yeah, from in my experience, that that insight often comes from getting the right people in the right in the room who have some experience with their customers. Yes, and let's not forget about marketing segments as well. They could get some glimpses if you want specifically for the recruitment, as, as you mentioned in the question. Yeah. Can I squeeze one more little, little one about jobs to be done and versus persona from Gustavo? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we've experimented a few times with jobs to be done. Uh, so we use them and kind of incorporated them inside the personas, kind of elaborating more on tasks, uh, for example, for a specific product or service. But the difference with jobs to be done, and we frame them in, the, in those kind of very snappy, um, structured ways, one sentence, the ones focusing on the context, the motivation, and the expected outcome, bringing that additional flavor uh, to the like emotional or social uh, expectations from that specific task when users will accomplish that task. So that could be really inbuilt as part of the persona. Or sometimes we um, know that there are certain tasks that users want to do. And we actually created like a separate document focusing just on these jobs to be done that comes together with persona, but it's like a separate slide going in all the nitty gritty details of how to make these jobs and what are the tasks for our uh, client for our customer and what are the tasks for the supplier for example so it's not either or they could come together you can create persona using jobs to be done or you can do two separate documents uh just elaborating on those jobs in more details so um thank you very much for joining us today i hope you found that uh, insightful and interesting useful as i said if you would like to talk to us uh, about personas or anything else that we might be able to uh, help you with then we would love to hear from you um joe hutton would be a good um, person to get in touch with initially um you've got the email addresses of uh, mila and i and myself here as well if you'd like to get in touch with us we'd, we'd also love to hear from you um, yeah, and, and as we said, as Mila just said, and as we said at the beginning, if you want to get a recording of today's webinar, um, then contact Joe. And we apologize that we haven't addressed all the questions. Uh, we just wanted so much to share all the insights with you that we've collated into this presentation. But please feel free to drop us a line and ask a question, uh, and we'll be more than happy to reply and keep the conversation going. You have our emails, and you can connect on LinkedIn as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.